So um, this is the panel discussion part of uh, the workshop. We've heard a lot of fascinating and thought-provoking talks over the last day and a half. Uh, by the way, I'm Dan Shaughnessy. I'm a program administrator at NIEHS. And there are two basic areas in this panel discussion we really want to focus on. The first is what are the research gaps, especially in molecular mechanism, that we need to kind of begin to fill uh, to enable further translation into population studies, but also to start thinking about how toxin exposures either alter or accelerate the processes uh, that we've heard about. And the other kind of main topic that I think we need to um, discuss a little bit is what are some of the research tools that we need to actually make this translation possible? So is it simply a matter of uh, sequencing technologies becoming cheaper and cheaper and kind of combining those with array technologies, or do we need, like um, uh, some of the reporter assays that we heard about this morning, do we need kind of more um, throughput and, and um, development of those to make this possible. So um, before we begin the regular panel discussion, I wanted uh, a few of the folks that you haven't heard from yet to maybe introduce themselves and talk about briefly their areas of interest, so maybe starting with Helmut. Okay, so uh, Helmut Zarbel, I'm a member of the panel, of the committee, actually. Um, uh, I'm a professor uh, of environmental occupational medicine at UMDNJ, soon to be Rutgers. Uh, I'm the director of our, of our NIEHS center, and my area of research is uh, cancer genetics and genomics. And I'm George Dast, and I'm a toxicologist with Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. A lot of my research is on predictive toxicology, and I also do a lot of risk assessment, so I guess that's why I'm on the panel. I also wanted to take this time to also um, provide a, a disclaimer. You know, I've been thinking about this, and we, we've learned in a previous workshop on the microbiome that about 90 percent of our genes are actually not, you know, our genes. There, there are, are microbial um, commensals and parasites and all that. And then I learned over the today that, that about of the 10 percent remaining, 17 percent is actually this uh, genetic parasite. Um, so that leaves about 8.3 percent that's actually me, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is coincidentally exactly the percentage of time that my answers make sense. So, <laughs> So um, the, the last panelist is uh, uh, Lawrence Baker, and he's the chair of the Southwest Oncology Group. It's one of the NCI-funded cl uh, clinical centers. Um, and we've asked um, Larry to kind of speculate a little bit, well, first of all, to describe um, what they do in the clinical centers, and then maybe speculate a little bit on how you might use some of these endpoints in terms of early diagnostics, um, looking at at-risk populations in, in the cancer field, and then also consequences of cancer treatment. Thank you. Um, well, there is now an NCI clinical trials network, and I knew this room looked familiar because some two years ago, the Institute of Medicine met here with all of the cancer cooperative groups. And I agreed with the Institute of Medicine that the cooperative groups needed to change. My fellow chairs were not very pleased with me. Uh, but, in fact, uh, the changes that were discussed two years ago in this room have taken place. So there is now an NCI clinical trials network in which there will be five cancer cooperative groups in this country. There used to be sometimes as many as 15. Four of them deal with adult patients, and one of them deals with children. And I happen to represent one of the groups that deals with adults. We were the Southwest Oncology Group because that was our roots in Houston, Texas, but now we just call ourselves SWOG, which is what everyone else calls us. And within our membership, we, we, we've been funded since 1956, and I hope that continues. Um, but we have 22 of the NCI designated cancer centers as our members, and 27 of the so-called cancer community oncology programs. So it's a mixture of academic medical centers, like cancer centers, and community hospitals across the country. We're in every state in the United States, and we have a major focus of activity in Latin America as well. And our trials are designed towards cancer control, cancer prevention, and cancer treatment. Uh, we've been talking about oxidative stress, and I need to digress for a moment and tell you about a trial we did in the prevention of prostate cancer, where we studied 30,000 men, as best we knew, did not have prostate cancer. And they received one of four therapies. They received the antioxidant selenium. They received the antioxidant vitamin E. They received both antioxidants, or they received neither. 
And the results were recently published, in fact, last year, that showed that the men who took vitamin E had an increased risk of prostate cancer. So those of you who want to understand the dilemma that we live in, in the end, it's definitive evidence in humans that guides the practice of medicine. Well, back to SWOG. So we, are, we consist of research committees that are mostly disease-oriented. They may be uh, some technology-oriented committees as well. Uh, and we do, the, as I've tried to imply, definitive phase two and three clinical trials that provide evidence for the change in practice in medicine. By example, to give you some metrics, I'll use the Leukemia Committee. And in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, they have performed 60 studies. They've studied 11,000 men and women who had leukemia. Um, they've collected bone marrows on some 50,000 50, times on those 11,000 patients, and those are fresh, frozen, stored marrows. And the cryopreservation process has been absolutely tested and is terrific. And they've, they've now published 170 manuscripts from those 60 trials, and in 16 cases, we would, dis we would agree with them that they've changed the practice of medicine and hopefully for the better. In addition to doing clinical trials, we also have a biobank that has well over half a million specimens. It's located at Nationwide Children's Hospital where the COG has its biobank. And, and uh, it is how I met Thea, in fact. She is one of our advisors because one of our criticisms that I agreed with is that we tried to be too protective, too selfish about these samples. We wanted the best scientists with the best ideas to have access to these samples, and Thea has been one of our advisors in that process. Too many of my colleagues are engaged in the study of Coca-Cola versus Pepsi-Cola. Okay. And only my children and grandchildren actually can distinguish those I can't but I don't think those are worthwhile questions for use of public funds. And I have said to my group that they are addicted to the study of new drugs, and they should instead be addicted to the study of biology as it applies to humans. To try and understand better cancer, how it occurs, why it does what it does, and to provide a greater understanding and give us new targets for diagnosis, new targets for treatment. The one thing that I've admonished uh, the group about is to avoid buzzwords. Some of you have heard me say that. I don't like people talking about personalized medicine. I've been practicing personalized medicine for 46 years, even before the phrase existed. I would like to think that every patient I've seen has been treated as an individual. I don't like things like molecular targeted therapy because it sort of ignores all of the past, and some of you spend some energies reminding us of the past. Well, the seven-position iguanine is the target of bifunctional alkylating agents. That's pretty specific, and it's pretty molecular. It might be old-fashioned, but it is. Well, at any rate, so that's who we are. As to answer the question uh, about the opportunities, I thought it was best uh, to, to actually try to be, uh, to, to try to be thoughtful. I hope you accept them. I want to explain to you the difference between, and, and I, I beg anyone's pardon who's heard this too many times already, but the difference between older and younger patients who develop acute myelogenous leukemia. There is a dramatic difference in those two populations. The older patient is much more likely to have had a precedent preceding myelodysplasia, myelodysplastic syndrome. They have abnormalities of chromosomes 5 and 7. They have complex karyotypes. They have many structural and nuclear and numeric abnormalities. But most important to us, they're more refractory, and the outcome of treating older AML patients is poorer in contrast to younger patients. I tell you that because those same features are the features of what we would call secondary or chemotherapy-induced or, if you like, chemotherapy-associated leukemia. A common place where that occurs is in the clinic with breast cancer. So one of the things that I think it would be worthwhile looking at is to examine women about to enter the next study of adjuvant therapy for breast cancer by doing a marrow before she gets her chemotherapy, after she completes her chemotherapy, and then in the 2 or 3% of those patients who go on to develop myelodysplastic syndrome or acute leukemia, 
to have the marrows examined then. We think that would be a great experiment to understand better what are the molecular changes that occur as a consequence of that chemotherapy, how relevant they are to AML or to other uh, problems, uh, and, and how well they characterize uh, genetic changes or genomic changes. Um, there's another form of chemotherapy-induced leukemia that is, rev that is uh, um, a consequence or uh, associated with topoisomerase II inhibition. And topoisomerase II drugs, like adromycin or etoposide, are commonly used drugs to treat pediatric sarcoma patients. So, and they also have second leukemias at an even higher incidence than in breast cancer. And their leukemias occur even sooner than in breast cancer. So another population that we think, at least for a discussion, that's worth studying are exactly those young men and women, or boys and girls, who are treated for bone cancers, either Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma, by the drugs that I've mentioned and other drugs. And they are marrowed. They would be in the same fashion as, as I just described. We think that would give us a greater understanding of the induction of leukemia and what are the epigenomic events that surround that. And finally, uh, I mentioned our, our banks. So we have, between CLGB and other cooperative group and ourselves, over 100,000 frozen marrows. And we would suppose that it would be worthwhile for perhaps some of you to consider looking at those marrows in the following way. The first would be to probably prove that the lymphocyte of those patients is normal because there's some argument as to whether or not they are. But if they are normal, then to contrast the, the, uh, the, uh, the leukemic cells as well as the environment in which the leukemic cells sit with the lymphocyte, think like a, we think that would be a perfectly good retrospective analysis uh, to be made. We think this so much that we'd like to challenge you all. We would like to sponsor another meeting where some of you and some of us get together and refine these ideas, bring them towards the clinic. This uh, nature being what it is, seek funding for this. We think the NCI would be supportive. They've been supportive of us for a long time. But we also understand that this could be uh, potentially more expensive. The question is, what are the best ideas? What are the biggest ideas? I've given three examples of a, one clinician who thought about this for a few weeks. I know I know smarter people than myself who can do better. David? Um, so we, maybe we can talk about that in a minute. The, uh, the other item we had here before we open up the panel discussion so NIEHS sponsored a workshop about a year ago, and it was in conjunction with the International Congress on Genetics and the Environmental Mutagen Society, which happened to be kind of back-to-back -back in Montreal. And the purpose of this workshop was really to think about um, the effect of environmental agents on copy number induction. Um, and Tom Glover was, uh, helped us organize that meeting. And I asked Tom, just since we were asking the same kind of questions, what are the recommendations for research and and, re and tools, maybe to just recap um, the recommendations that we had from that smaller group. Yes. So the, I'll have to say that the major focus of that workshop was really on human variation, genomic variation, and uh, germline CNVs, um, not really on cancer CNVs or some of the other topics that have been discussed here. So with that in mind, these are the major recommendations um, from that group. First, we need to, and this is up front for a reason, really fully characterize the structural variation of both human populations and in any model organisms that we want, care to study to answer these the questions that are important in, in, in regard to genome plasticity particularly with repetitive regions that are difficult to resolve. Um, those of us in genetics and genomics know very well that the genome sequence is not complete. It is plenty to do. And I think that this point is well illustrated by the discussion during John's talk, during the talk on retrotransposition, where we know that many of the 
areas that contain repetitive elements have yet to be found and the variation in between individuals has yet to be discovered. There are small insertions that are difficult to, to sequence through that are clearly going to be, certainly going to be polymorphic in populations. Understanding all of this is essential to understand the full spectrum of normal variation. Um, to have a good reference genomes, not just genome, and to evaluate new mutations and their phenotypic impact. When you do see something new, is it also found in some other population and you can evaluate the phenotype? And any precipitating environmental factors that might be involved in this. Secondly, it's important to accurately determine the de novo mutation rate for both normal and pathogenic CNVs in, in, in humans. Um, both in the germline, but also in somatic cells. Again, we talked a bit during this, this workshop about how CNVs, especially those coupled to errors in replication, are predicted to be formed at a significant rate in all of our somatic tissues, and that's largely unexplored. The germline mutation rate for pathogenic and normal CNVs has yet to be fully determined and accurately determined. So studies of trios, um, families, and cells from a variety of tissues, because I at least would predict that we're going to find a lot of variation in different tissues, just like with retrotransposition, in terms of the somatic CNV um, rates. Uh, we need to expand research to elucidate the molecular pathways involved in CNV mutation. We heard a lot about that. This, this is very important. So far, we've, we've learned a, a lot from both uh, um, studies of CNVs that are found in normal individuals and in, in individuals with genomic disorders, um, allowing models to be developed for what may be involved in their generation. Um, and also from in vitro studies. Um, and it's, it's really critical because we, I think it's clear from the workshop here that there's still a lot of questions um, about, number one, what creates that initial lesion that will be driven e either into an error-free repair mechanism or an error-prone mechanism that's going to give rise to the CNV. We don't know what's driving that choice. Really, what that initial lesion is. Is it a double strand break? Is it just a stalled fork without a break? <laughs> many, many questions. That'll, and that'll help us um, understand this. Right now, we have good evidence that replication stress is one such factor, and we need to go further. Um, we need to develop both cell culture and animal model approaches to explore C and B induction by environmental exposures. So they're, they're both model organisms and in vitro approaches will be very, very useful. We, we heard about the potential for zebrafish and daphnia and also from Luis Argueso uh, with a comment through the webcast how yeast might be very important for recurrent CNVs and that ha might have a lot of potential. It sounds exciting. Um, and one, the key to understanding the potential of molecular of model organisms, as we've discussed here, and it's ongoing, is to really understand what the CNV or the copy number changes are at the molecular level and the factors involved, the mechanisms in the model organisms for direct relation to what we see in humans, and that's ongoing work. We look forward to those answers soon. Um, we need to begin to evaluate the effects of the environment on disease risk with differing copy number variants overlapping environmentally sensitive genes. So we have a lot of normal CNBs, and we need to take a close look, and, and with those that we know of now and those that we see occurring de novo, do they span genes that are involved in responses to environmental agents, and what does that have a an effect on disease risk. I don't think anybody has done that to any extent. And finally, we need to evaluate importantly and finally, but ultimately, the effects of Canada and environmental agents directly in humans in at-risk populations. 
The technologies are there now to do this, both using genomic arrays, but whole genome sequencing approaches and proper algorithms then to sort this out. Um, directly in humans and at risk populations. But clearly first we have to understand the, what the candidate mutations are, or mutagens are. What are those at risk populations? Um, and the de novo rate of CN mutation, CNV mutations in humans. One candidate population that it was suggested in the workshop relates to our work, and that's looking at sickle cell patients who are treated with hydroxyurea. It's not a common environmental agent, but it is an agent, and it will allow a test of the hypothesis. And we've um, talked to people about that. It's not as easy to set up the epidemiology as one may think. Um, but these are the sorts of things we need to be thinking about. Um, and three generation cohorts will be essential to evaluate CNVs arising in female oogenesis, a point that I made yesterday in my discussion. So those are some of the major recommendations. So uh, why don't we open it up? Do we have some um, questions? Uh, I, I think we'll start with Cheryl. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to thank the panelists for agreeing to help us uh, what is an arguably one of the most important parts of the meeting, which is to circle back and reflect on what we've heard so that we can capture it and, and be um, better informed as we move forward. Uh, one of the themes that I think has occurred throughout that, that didn't get highlighted, but I would like to see us highlight, although it was mentioned in almost every talk, is um, how susceptibility to changes in genomic plasticity may be changing across the life course. And, um, in fact, now, you know, the, the Paracelsus saying, you know, the dose makes the poison is now being modified to say the dose and the host make the poison. And so this idea that there may be windows of susceptibility when genomic plasticity is more at risk in environmental exposure, I think we've already captured a few of those. And perhaps as a research need or at least a beginning place, we might say that uh, when examining uh, environmental factors that you believe are acting in those windows, one of the readouts needs to be uh, looking at effects on genomic plasticity. So uh, I'm going to offer a couple that I heard, and then maybe if the panel um, can also add to that list, we can maybe come up with a relatively short list that we think might be uh, high value, immediate places to look. So Ken, in his talk, um, I did not realize that early in uh, embryogenesis is a time when the the lines are all jumping around, so that sounds like a pretty interesting window we might want to look at. Uh, we heard that perhaps in response to chemotherapeutics, there could be something going on with genomic plasticity. Uh, those are just the two that I keyed in on, and maybe the, the panel could uh, throw a few more into that list. Have any comments? Just, uh, I think that's a, a really good idea, Cheryl. You know, one, one thing that might be really interesting and, and tractable in terms of very early embryogenesis is that, you know, obviously there's an incredible amount of uh, embryonic loss uh, in the pre-implantation period. Um, and there's been some but probably not enough analysis of the genetics. And most of those studies are old and really focused on aneuploidy and polyploidy. Um, and, and not some of these other things that are a little bit harder to measure. And I, I think that that would be a, a, a tractable population to look at. The other, the other way of, of thinking about, um, and you know, maybe this is even more interesting from a clinical perspective, is understanding a little bit more about um, what, the, the, what the purpose of genomic plasticity is, if it has a purpose. Uh, and and we, we focus a lot, and I think it, rightly so, on all the potential adverse consequences of this. But, um, you know, could there, could there not be, um, and, uh, you know, I think from the, the background reading, for example, that, that we got, I'm not an expert in, there, in this area, but from the background reading, at least it suggests to me that there are good reasons for, uh, positive reasons for genomic plasticity that, that may in fact simply become out of control in the disease states that we've talked about today. And I think that I would add that to your list. I mean, particularly, um, you know, during development, both early and, um, you know, prenatal or, or post, uh, early prenatal as well as early postnatal development, you know, one can imagine there being significant reasons for significant plasticity. 
Um, and uh, you know, from, from what I see, these are areas that are uh, beginning to be evaluated, um, but, but have a lot of potential in terms of understanding. Exactly, exactly. I think the, uh, and then so Cheryl, um, I think the idea about windows for when this happens is very important, but if you could expand that also to states, certain physiological states, I think that would also incorporate some of these ideas. And for example, one place that one might look very productively might be wounding. Okay, it has many connections to what we're talking about. Number one, areas of chronic wounding are known to have a very high predisposition to cancer mutations, etc. Number two, when tissues are wounded is when they need to access these programs of plasticity because what happens is you have cells in tissue, in most tissue, when you have wounding, the tissue closes down. There's mutagens being spread out, etc. So most of them close down. But some cells go in the opposite direction and they proliferate. And they have to be completely reprogrammed now to create the tissues that have been damaged. They, ha they go through epigenetic changes, they go through um, morphological changes, etc. And I think that that is probably at the basis of of why these programs have been kept around in adult tissues is because at certain times during the lifetime of an individual, you need to access these programs for positive purposes. I would wanted to expand. One of the reasons that I, I thought about looking at patients who develop leukemia is, in fact, the flip side of that question, which is 98 or 99% of those people cured don't get leukemia. So you actually have both populations to look at uh, in that regard. And I know uh, I, I'm going to ask John uh, when I get home to give me the references of, of where this was looked at. I presume in vitro where, where drugs were, uh, cells were exposed to drugs or to radiation. But that's not quite the way it's done in the clinic. And that may, in fact, be different. We give drugs repeatedly in cycles. Radiation is given in multiple fractions. And in fact, that, that dose and frequency may in fact give some insight. So the other area that uh, hasn't been mentioned at all during the conference, except indirectly through stress and the stress hormones, is the influence of hormones and, and all types of hormones, stress, developmental, et cetera. Um, what's the role uh, of these, the plasticity when you, you have changes in hormones? I'll just, it's one word, I'll add it, aging is something we really haven't considered, but an accumulation of different structural mutations with aging and epige concurrent epigenetic changes is something that should be explored, I think. Jim? To, to sort of bring us back on target to Tom's slide, as well as um, get a reductionist type view of what can we do experimentally, the way John likes to approach things quite a bit, is if we look at number two there, begin to evaluate the effects of environment on disease risk with differing copy number variants overlapping environmentally sensitive genes. <clears throat> if we think about the amylase story, where the copy number is directly related to the amount of starch in your diet, if we think about many of the pharmacogenetic traits which differ around the world, in Saudi Arabia, your duplications in CYP2D6 are tremendous. What is the exposure there that selected that out, evolutionary? And if we think about even in primate evolution, the gorillas have hugely amplified. I forgot which metabolism gene it is because they have a diet that has a poison in it that kills other primates, but they can survive on that. So we can link directly the chemical to the actual copy number and then try to understand those better we may be able to get at some of the genes Tom was talking about. So, so Jim, I had asked you yesterday, uh, we really, and I think you said this too, Tom, that we really don't know much about the influence of copy number, duplications in metabolizing genes or transport or things but that... Pharmacogenetics, I think we yeah. know a little bit, and we're starting to have the assays, and actually it's very clinically relevant. So it... it I, just come, I mean, it kind of drives home a, a broader point in that with normal CNVs and certainly with 
the, the myriad of de novo CNVs that are being seen in, in clinical settings, exactly what the phenotypic consequences of those are. We've just, we're at the tip of the iceberg. It really yeah, hasn't, it has been descriptive iceberg. so far and, and not really functional. it's very environmentally dependent because you see it different in different parts of the world. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, one of the things that really started me thinking yesterday was your Daphnia talk um, where um, the, the, the same gene, essentially, that um, Daphnia is using a, an expansion of, of copy number on um, you know, mammals, it appears, use a tremendously inducible, um, you know, tremendously active promoter for. And so, um, you know, I simply mention this as, as uh, you know, an, another area for research is understanding, you know, the, the different mechanisms by which an organism may in fact cope with um, environmental challenges, this being one that we haven't previously examined to the extent that we should. Other questions? Uh, I, I have a question. So uh, basically, uh, have we, um, cons if, if we are focusing on the uh, germline, um, so w we are looking at all these big projects. A lot of these uh, children centers are collecting, like they're going to uh, sequence 100,000 kids and their parents. So is it is it reasonable to even think about collecting um, ejaculates, so for example, sperm from from fathers, because I think it would be hard to half as eggs. But so so, what kind of biorepository samples that we can forward looking and and actually collected collectively for for future investigation? Then the so I'm going to stop there. But I have one additional question I want to ask is. What happened to this entire generation of assisted reproductive um, um, offsprings? Currently, they are the oldest ones are at age 22. I just want to get some insight on these two questions. I, I like the idea about storing sperm. Right now, you can't just look at a population of sperm and sort out what's going on in the single cell level, but the technologies are being developed for single cell genomics. So that's forward thinking. And I like that. Uh, but, if you, but if you look at like cancer cells, you can actually now get single cancer cells with a, a commercial kit. And, and should we really following prostate cancer uh, for, for not just one time point, but basically like over a period of multiple, multiple time points, the same with breast cancer. So, so to see what kind of changes are happening with multiple time points and in individual cells. So would that be more informative than um, trying to get um, to a, a, a specimen that we took uh, that we remove early on, I mean, that that might give you a better description. So, so I'm very interested in this technology. So I'm aware of where the state of the art is right now for single cell pan genomic, entire genomic analysis. Um, there are some reports of that. If we're looking for very small events, which most CNVs are. Um, the current technology is very limited in detecting those. You can pick up aneuploidy and things. And not to get into detail, but you have to amplify the genome to get this to work. And so picking up very small events is very difficult, unless you know where you're looking. Um, but I think as we go forward, the technology will develop. Well, see, <coughs> the, another very good source would be like sputum. So sp once we, you got sputum, you can sort it. I mean... These are all possible uh, sources that we can actually store. And then not just studying cancer or other things, but absolutely be really important. But maybe some, um, if anybody has any thoughts about this new generation of, uh, of individuals that are derived from assisted reproduction, maybe that's also very interesting. Uh, down to the point that when we can actually take a single 
um, nuclei from a male germ cell and put it, I mean, with absolutely no selection and put it into a zygote, uh, to, uh, put it into an egg. So, so that, what, what would that happen? Like, I mean, what is the implication for that? Uh, just talking, since you were talking about resources, one that I thought of during the first session when we were talking about the, the, the telomere variation, um, the Department of Defense has been collecting samples uh, from the unfortunate individuals who are sent off to different parts of the world, and they collect samples before, during, and after deployment. Uh, so looking at telomere variations as a result of stress, I think that would, that would be a very useful resource for, uh, you know, to, be, to be looked at. Uh, Martin Stevens with the uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. I want to take us back to our conversation yesterday about uh, telomeres. I, I was intrigued by the notion that uh, it looks like telomere size can be uh, seen as a sort of biomarker for, in some sense, for uh, lifetime exposure to uh, adverse effects. And I, I raise the issue in two contexts. Uh, uh, related to the use of, uh, of animals for these experiments. We heard yesterday a little bit about um, some uh, uh, rodent use and other animal models and maybe some limitations of those. But um, one cautionary note in, in that uh, uh, the telomere size could, could be confounded by the uh, differential effects of uh, housing, social grouping, type of feed, et cetera. Um, if indeed these are these are differential or seen as adverse, and even if they're controlled between experimental and control groups, if you're operating with animals that uh, um, are experiencing adverse effects for lack of social companions or being in a barren cage, you could be trying to tease out effects in a very small parameter space where these animals are are not uh, normal to in 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 many respects. But the, the other issue I wanted to mention, primarily for selfish reasons, for those of us interested in uh, refining procedures for animals to make their lives a little better in the lab, is that if telomere size can be shown to be a nice integrator of, uh, of exposure to adverse events, et cetera, then one can use that as a readout in various types of uh, refinement procedures where you vary things to look at how well the animals thrive under those conditions where you add or subtract cage mates or enrich their cages to different degrees. So uh, you know, if, if this turns out to be the case, one can get beyond short-term readouts for these uh, effects of refinements and look at lifetime effects. I mean, after all, the, the lives of these animals in cages are fairly circumscribed. It's not like we're doing epidemiology on people experiencing all kinds of potential uh, confounders. So I, I was intrigued by that possibility and, and also the notion that these sorts of things can confound uh, rodent experiments. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on any of that. Next question. Hi, Lauren Zeiss with California EPA. Um, I have a question around the third bullet, which is the design of epidemiology studies. And maybe this is a question for Thea. In thinking about the um, heterogeneous nature uh, within an individual in terms of cells and community of cells, um, many studies characterize individuals with uh, single average measures. And I'm wondering what the uh, sort of steps forward to asking um, and designing more complicated epidemiology designs to try to capture this issue of heterogeneity and the potential for certain thresholds potentially driving um, pathology? I think that's a really good question. And I think in biology we're missing a lot of um, information because it's like looking for the keys under the lamppost when you think something is happening in this tissue, but you keep looking at this tissue uh, because it's easy to access. So I think that in some cases that's going to be a major problem and perhaps why we're not making it as much advances as, as we would hope. But I've thought about this a lot, and I also think that there's some other aspects of this that, that maybe aren't quite as dire in that if you start to think about the body, 
we're starting really to appreciate how connected it is and how the cells communicate with one another. And this is being seen on many, many fronts, not only in terms of the microbiome and how it interacts with the cells of our body, and the conversation goes back and forth. We affect the, the microbes in our body, and the microbes in our body affect us. Uh, but this is also being played out in terms of things like metastasis. There's some beautiful work coming out right now indicating that you know the, the signals that come from this tissue actually affect whether a metastasis is going to be formed in, in a distal site. And it's not only a metastasis, or it's not only the facilitation of a cancer of the same tumor type, but it's also of other tumor types. So what this is starting to do is to give us insight into the amazing uh, communications that are going on within our body. And so if you look at the right thing, when you're looking under the lamppost, it may be informative, but if you don't look at the right thing, it could be a bust. So, Thea, maybe to follow up, I mean, each of the kind of genetic targets that we talked about, th there's a lot of indication of mosaicism and your idea of kind of phenotypic mosaicism, too. But in practical terms, most people are just going to be able to look at blood. So, I mean, do you, are there kind of ways to think about this where you can't get other tissues or you know, through modeling or um, experimental? So I was, I, I've really enjoyed this meeting tremendously. And I, I'm, I'm particularly happy that it covered retrotransposon, CNVs, and uh, telomeres. Because um, it actually allows one to start expanding your thought processes. And I think about genomic instability, genomic plasticity, or genomic fluidity a lot. And you can start to combine those, as well as several other aspects that we haven't dealt with in this meeting, as well as epigenetics, et cetera. And you start to come up with a, a bigger picture. And um, what I'm really interested in is um, what it's saying about the processes. We started to get at this. Um, Ken started to get at this. We've, we've started to talk, and, and Cheryl's question about windows and, and about stages, et cetera. I think what these things are are manifestations of a process that's being turned on. It's being turned on at different times in, in a life, whether for evolutionary purposes or, or um, heritable purposes or for the whole purpose of generating diversity because you need it in a wounding situation, results in cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So how does that bring me back to what you were saying? It, it's actually some of the first comments that I made in, in my talk, many people are studying, what is it, um, the alkylating agent and the O6-methylguanine adduct. That's beautiful. We need to know about that. Some people are talking about this copy number variation with that disease. That's great. But I think it's a manifestation of a much bigger um, aggregate of these ideas, and that in looking at some of these, you're actually looking at others as well. We've heard many things during this meeting that overlap. You start to talk about telomeres and talk about repair. You start to talk about retrotransposons. And I think that's a very fruitful area of, of thought and investigation that pulls all of this together. Did that answer the question? David? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I totally agree with uh, what I really enjoyed this meeting. And um, there is this a lot of overlap. And uh, I hope we can continue to uh, get out of our pigeonholes, sort of, and, and have other meetings like this. Um, but my question was also maybe to Tom. And I, my, I really perked up when you talked about actually getting the sequences of these repetitive elements. And I think for the CMVs and for the telomeres and for the retrotransposon elements. We really don't have the se sequences, I, and it's holding us back. But I, I mentioned in my talk that about 50% of the telomere sequences are not known. Um, and I'm just wondering about those efforts. What, what are the, the uh, practical uh, ways of moving forward on actually getting the sequences? So there, and maybe some of the other human geneticists could add to this, well, there are certainly efforts to fill in these gaps. I mean, that has been a primary goal of the 
human genome sequencing project since its first completion, <laughs> filling in the gaps. And there are still gaps, and there are, and, and, and to take that one step further, we need to know not just what one is, but what the variation is then. We have to sequence lots of genomes at those sites to know the variation as well, to be able to really understand its full meaning. But in terms of the exact details of the efforts to fill in the gaps in the sequence. Are those John like or longer, Jim, can you comment longer read methods like PAC bio systems and what, I mean, we. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was just at an NHGRI meeting the last two days Good. before coming here. And there are still gaps that need to be filled in, but there's also the question of is there one reference genome? Exactly, the variation. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and it's always been constructed as a haploid genome, which shows you how little we appreciated copy number. I mean, we didn't even pay attention to it in the genome reference, right? We made a haploid genome for the genome reference. I don't know a single haploid walking around on this earth. Um, uh, but uh, there, there will be further efforts to try to fill in some of the variation on UCSC browser and the ensemble browser. They will not put um, copy number per se. They're going to have to be separate databases. They can't figure out how to integrate that easy, but it is thought that from the clinical resequencing programs, the variants found in nucleotide changes will be added to the UCSD browser. Um, uh, Decipher is starting to put them on their browser, and that's also linked to phenotype. So I think we're going to have more and more of these tools that will be helpful, but sometimes still you're going to go into read into the genome that are complicated that we all deal with. John deals with a reference genome that doesn't have most of the line elements in the right position. They're different in every person you go into. Um, you're going to have to realize the limitations of the reference. But hey, it's better than what we had before. It makes our life a lot better. But we also have to think about how the data are generated, as John has alluded to, and I think I did, that these whole genome sequencing things are totally dependent on that reference because we computationally cannot build from raw sequence. The PAC bio data is very error prone, but starting to work decently enough to do a first low coverage pass and build onto that Illumina reads. We're all waiting to see how Proton Machine actually does because one day rather than five is something that's gonna be very helpful to all of us. The price will continue to plummet. You will all, as long as there's competition, which makes fear to me for the array area because of the wisdom of Roche to shut down Nimblegen arrays, close it because it wasn't making enough money, and now Agilent has no competition. We're probably going to see those prices go up, which we'll all hate, and that might drive us more towards the sequencing too. We'll have to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lou Gross, University of Tennessee. So uh, interweaving across uh, many of the uh, things that have been said here um, is that it's clear from what Thea said and many others that there really is a need for a more integrative approach. Several of you have remarked on the benefits of coming together uh, from somewhat different perspectives uh, from uh, people that are highly reductionist to those that are doing things that are more integrative. The question is for environmental health. We're pretty far away from anything like a whole human model, um, I would guess. <laughs> and uh, we can't even do a cell model for, uh, really effectively. Can we come up with any sort of a uh, suggested set of future planning directions for uh, agencies such as NIEHS on, on a mechanism to come up with kind of what are the orders of impacts? Just what's first order, second order, et cetera, uh, in terms of investments on uh, toxicants on just cancer, for example. 
So how do we go about doing that? And I know that's a big question. So I, I want to take the opportunity to try and answer part of that question, but also combine it with what you had asked about what resources do we go to if we want to study these things. And that's why I, I was so delighted that Larry uh, is here, because I think that going to clinical samples, going to tissue where there's uh, um, a variety of cells, but we're not sure that Actually, we're sure that not all cells respond in the same way. And so to have access to, to the different cells and ask which ones respond, which ones don't respond, is important. I think having um, the tissues, human tissues, that are actually treated with these agents, pollutants, et cetera, and being able to look at different endpoints of genomic plasticity, whether it's um, do the L1s move, do the telomeres get altered? Do the breaks that specific pollutants provide provide the template switching um, substrates that are needed for, for things? Um, uh, CNVs, the actual way, how do these uh, things that interrupt DNA replication, again, again we come to stalled forks and template switching type things. Are there some commonalities between these that we can study in tissues before the person gets exposed and after the person gets exposed. Larry gave a couple of examples about looking at bone marrow biopsies, et cetera, but there are other tissues that are in the clinical repositories. And in many cases, or in clinical trials, you can get the tissue naive before it's treated and after it's treated at different time points. And I think that this would be a really beautiful way to start to integrate some of the thinking of the, the really exciting talks that we heard here. So if, so, if I could just okay. extend just a second, Tom, a couple of things. One is that you're exactly right, that you would have, the reason I chose the two examples they did is you would have the primary tumor to look at. And uh, not all of them are cured. Some of them are going to, in fact, develop metastasis, and you'll have metastasis. So you have those two tissues from wherever the metastasis might be, in the lung or, or where have you. And the second is that it, in biomarker development, it's an important principle to understand that treatment itself may be a variable. And so, the, you know, the, many cancer centers and many other institutions have large biobanks. The only thing that distinguishes the group biobanks is that the treatment is, in fact, controlled because their they're tissues collected from prospective studies with very specific therapies being applied, usually in a randomized way, which is also helpful. That's the only unique feature of those uh, specimens. So actually, I think we're going to have to wrap this up. I, I think one point to what Lou was saying is maybe we could think um, about predicting what classes of compounds are actually going to have these effects. So beyond, I mean, we talk a lot about replication stress, but are there other things like cross-linking agents or um, topoisomerase inhibitors that we talked about this morning, you know, as a way to kind of strategize, you know, how to test these and, and what systems to test them in? So maybe finish off with that one last comment, and then we have I, to move on. Just real, I, I don't want to end my comments with something negative, just food for thought that if you're going to look at effects of chemicals on bone marrow cells, and I may be missing something about the, I think it's a fantastic idea to look after, before and after chemotherapy, but if you're dealing with a heterogeneous population of cells and you're looking for rare events, the technology is going to be a huge challenge and that needs to be thought, of, thought about well in advance. And last right. comment. Yeah, just, I, I think that's a, a great um, uh, idea is to, to understand a little bit more. And I think getting to, to Lou's point about that as well is, you know, the more that we can understand about the mechanism by which these things arise, um, the more it will inform us as to, you know, whether there are unique classes of chemicals that we haven't thought about, um, and if so, how to, how to evaluate them in a predictive sense and how to interpret the results in a risk assessment context. So, um, you know, I mean, I love seeing some of the, the, the really deep mechanistic work around the transposable elements. That's the kind of thing that we will also need for copy number variants and, and especially um, telomere length control. Great. I think we're going to have to s stop there and uh, thank all the panelists for a really nice discussion. And I think. Uh...
So while Ken's coming to the uh, podium, I just want to point out our next um, committee's meeting is on big data. I think some of the uh, things we were talking about today as far as sort of structure for um, integrating data will come up at that meeting as well.